Hey guys, it's Dave Burrows. I am Chief Investment Officer and CEO here at Barometer Capital Management. I want to welcome you all to our weekly webcast. Uh, I was scrambling a little bit this afternoon. I had a very nice 86th birthday lunch with my father. And uh, so uh, the, the deck may be a little shorter today, but there's lots to talk about. Uh, lots going on in the market, especially in the last couple of days uh, that I want to share with you. Uh, so I'm going to get right to it. We'll answer questions after the after the main part of the presentation. And for any of you who would like to throw a question into the chat uh, or into the question section, please don't hesitate to do so. I'll try and get to all of them as best I can. Um, so here we are now in uh, the end of September. Uh, historically, September the 21st is the worst day of the fall. Uh, we are two thirds of the way through the worst two years of the two, first two weeks of the year, sorry, worst two weeks of the year, last two weeks of September. Uh, we're in a run up to an election. Uh, there's a lot going on uh, and markets have been remarkably calm. So I always say that markets behave the way they have come into an event acting. So we had the Fed over the past week uh, set up coming into the Fed, lots of concern about what the Fed might or might not do. Uh, market kind of took it in stride, uh, but there are some takeaways. And so I want to kind of get to it. Uh, I'll move fairly fast through the first part. You know, we continue to think that we're in a structural bull market that started in 2013. Uh, you can see the uh, market coming out of this long sideways range at the end of 2013. We've had a number of interruptions along the way, each one sort of lower bound by the rising 200 week moving average. Uh, but as we talked about going through this period, when you eventually exited and made a new high, it was likely that we would have, you know, two to three years of relatively calm conditions, which tends to be the case uh, during structural bull markets. So I get it that there's lots of things to worry about. I know there's a lot of moving parts in the world, a lot of people who are very cautious and bearish. Uh, but I really do think that they are on the wrong side of things. This market has been working its way higher uh, fairly steadily. We've had a couple of close to 10% pullbacks over the course of the summer that have repaired themselves very quickly. We're now up 1.4% for the month of September uh, for the S&P. And you'll see that other markets are sort of playing along. There's the S&P 500 from the low in October of 22. Had a series of higher lows along the way. You can see these moving averages all moving nicely higher. We're above the 200, uh, 200 uh, week moving average, sorry, 200 day moving average, 50 day moving average, 21 day moving average, eight day moving average. On all measures, we are trending higher. In fact, in the past week, the S&P 500 finally made a new high post the 9.7% uh, pullback in the S&P in the month of July. Now we talked early in the year about the fact that there was only a very small number of stocks beating the S&P. As of yesterday, Diana tells me that now 64% of stocks are ahead of the S&P now on the year. What a turnaround that has been over the course of the summer. That, of course, is exactly what we want to see. We like to see a broadening market. We like to see lots of groups participating. We like to see lots of stocks doing well. It gives us lots of opportunity to diversify. In a world where there's seven or eight stocks driving all the returns, it's not an easy market to manage, and we were fortunate to do pretty well over the last couple of years. Uh, but uh, this market gets easier as the market broadens. There's the equally weighted S&P 500. It actually made a new high before the market cap weighted S&P did. We talked about that being a very positive clue. When the market pulled back or the S&P pulled back just about 10% in the month of July, the equal weight pulled back 6% and very quickly went to make a new high. So we've been marching higher here. We're just off the 52-week uh, high today, um, uh, down just, a, oh, no, just up just a snip on the close, it looks like, uh, but very constructive. When we look at the NASDAQ 100, not quite as positive a picture. We're above the rising 200-day, uh, 50 days dipping a little lower. We have been unable to make new highs since we did in the early part of July. Of course, July, gave us a 16% pullback in the NASDAQ 100. Uh, and part of that, we think, is that the market is looking forward to rate cuts. 
Uh, it's looking forward to the fact that we get into a liquidity cycle. Central banks are cutting around the world. Um, we saw last night Japan, sorry, China bring out the bazooka. Uh, the, the PBOC suggested they would provide $500 billion uh, in equivalent uh, uh, cash to funds to buy shares. And if that wasn't enough, they would add more. Uh, that helps to relieve some of the concerns about the market pressures we've seen in China. We'll see whether that makes a difference. Uh, but there are alternatives to just the big secular growers. Now, when we look at the U.S. dollar, and I put this up front and center because I think we're at a really important point. The U.S. dollar tends to strengthen at a time of difficulty, and during the sell-off in 2022 was no different. Uh, the uh, DXY, which is the U.S. dollar versus the basket of world currencies, made a high in October of 22, right around the time the market made its lows. And as the U.S. dollar started to weaken, people were taking dollars and buying riskier assets, doing other things with the money. They were buying some international companies. They were buying some sectors that had not performed well. And almost every wiggle that we've had in the market since then found a bottom when the US dollar started to weaken. So this is the October of 23 lows. So we've highlighted that while there were lots of concerns over the summer, the US dollar just continued to weaken. Now, it's, it, it may be that it's just weakening because we know the Fed is cutting, but of course all central banks are cutting. But there is some real concern around the levels of debt in the US government. And that is a concern because the Fed has shown a willingness at any sign of weakness to ease monetary policy. And central banks around the world have used their money supply as a piggy bank to help support economies. Now, here we are, the US dollar is sitting right on the recent lows. So there was a low early in 2024, a low in August. And here we are, actually, we closed below these lows for today. There's one final line in the sand uh, at around par, 100. Uh, that goes back to July of last year. My guess is closing on the lows, we're going lower tomorrow. And this has a lot of implications. Importantly, it tells a tale that global investors are willing to move from a safe haven asset or what some perceive as a safe haven asset into other types of assets. Now, part of it is uh, central banks like China and Russia and Brazil and Saudi have been buying gold instead of buying US treasury bonds. That creates less demand for dollars. There's some evidence that the BRIC countries are setting up to, to bring a competing trading currency, the BRIC trading unit, which would be partially backed by gold. Uh, but the net of it is U.S. dollar is weakening, and that's all we really need to know. Now, <clears throat> uh, global stocks tend to do well when U.S. dollar is weakening. Japan, you know, came out of its malaise of the last uh, 30 years. It's been working its way higher. India this week put in a new 52-week high uh, coming out of its long bear market. Uh, Taiwan has been behaving better. Argentina, Latin American stocks behaving exceedingly well, partly because there is a fair bit of commodity exposure there. Um, TSX, which acts more like global stocks, is outperforming uh, the S&P so far on the year. That's an unusual thing, especially for those that are particularly bearish with the Canadian economy. Tells you one thing, a lot of companies are not specifically focused on the Canadian economy. They may trade here, they may be domiciled here, uh, but not completely uh, uh, dependent on the Canadian consumer. Uh, but I think all of these things are very relevant because after a long period of underperformance, there's opportunities for investors to be invested outside of the U.S., where there's a very high concentration of investment dollars over the last number of years. So moving on, fixed income, uh, you know, yields have been moving higher here since the middle of 2020. We have put in a series of higher lows. Recently, as we've come into the tightening cycle, you've seen the 10-year yields back off. We were at about 4.7%, now at 3.7%. My guess is that through the loosening cycle, yields can come down further, maybe as far down as 3%. Uh, we'll see. But again, that adds liquidity to the market. 
when we look at the performance of the TLT, which is the long-term treasury bond ETF, it is off the lows uh, of August last year. Not a lot off the lows, about 10%. Uh, certainly other income assets have behaved better. Dividend paying stocks relative to the aggregate bond index have been trending higher. It means relatively stocks are dividend stocks behaving better. REITs over the last number of months, we've talked about these over since, since the spring, have been outperforming. Uh, utilities clearly outperforming. All of these would be alternatives to owning government debt. All of them pay dividends. All of them get better tax treatment. All of them have a little bit of growth in the dividends. We think there are more interesting things to do than to be buying treasury bonds. Now going back to the dollar for a moment, when the dollar's weakening, it also tends to be positive for commodities. Now, when you're getting into the end of a tightening cycle, you would expect you're gonna see uneven economic data. In fact, that's why they've been calling it a tightening cycle. They're trying to slow growth, slow inflation. So lots of investors will have decided along the way that the Fed is over tightening. And in that process, decide to make bets against the economy. If I look at the commodity index, we clearly made a low in 2020 and had a great first leg higher up into 2022. Then we went through that tightening cycle. And in fact, about six months ago, broke out of that range and then moved sideways. Now, with hedge funds making short bets against commodities, which would be a great thing to do if you thought the economy was going over the edge, they really haven't been able to do much damage. And look at this monthly bar, this acceleration in commodity prices over the last four weeks, as in fact, we got the first Fed loosening. Of course, the Fed is not the first central bank to cut, but they are an important one. And with 50 basis points of cut, they've given incentive or license to other central banks to be more aggressive in their rate cuts. My guess is Canada does a 50 basis point cut at the next meeting. But it's important because we're coming off of very important relative lows, commodities relative to equities. And yes, we back and filled a little bit over the last few months. And yes, you know, fund traders got to their most short position commodities since the worst point of the commodities bear market in 2015. And look what's happening. So we've talked a little bit about gold. I sound a bit like a gold bug over the last few weeks because my, my view has been that the setup is just so, so, so bullish for gold. Not only are central banks buying gold and US dollar weakening, but individual investors have been ignoring it and fund managers have been ignoring it because of course, over a long period of time, if you've underperformed in that asset class, it won't be a well-liked asset. So gold is now up 29% on the year. And my guess is it's early stages because the last bear market and consolidation wound up yielding a return of 350% from 2005 through 2011. And things don't repeat, but they often rhyme. We are very clearly broken out of this range. And my guess is we're going a fair bit higher in both gold and silver. And we highlighted that while gold prices were going higher, ETF holdings were going down. Investors were selling the strength, not believing it might hold up. But here's some new data on flows. This is money going into or out of the gold ETFs. And you can see they became less and less and less negative. And only in the month of September have invested, investors started adding money to the gold ETF. So it may be that this is the end. I doubt it. I think that there's likely a long way that we can go. Now let's talk copper for a moment. Copper more economically sensitive, not really used as a safe haven asset. Certainly uh, did pull back heading into the fall. And about four weeks ago, we said, look, we are now at the point that this long-term moving average where we should see copper prices hold and turn higher. And that's exactly what we've had happen. My guess is that's the last check back before what will likely be a more protracted up market. We've come out of a long bear market. We consolidated through a Fed tightening cycle. 
uh, and we are now turning higher with fund investors short copper and with people making a bet copper can't do well because the Chinese economy has been having difficulty. Even though we know we need copper for electric vehicles and for data centers and for AI uh, data centers, uh, and the fact that copper supply is, is very low, uh, my guess is there is uh, some real upside in these companies. Now, when we uh, look at silver, Silver also is breaking out of a long sideways consolidation. This was basically today. Um, we've and, and this correlates with other currencies. There's two currencies that tend to move in tandem with commodities. Of course, there's other things that impact them. The Australian dollar, Aussie does a lot of trade with China. And you can see that while people have been concerned about China, the Australian dollar has been making a series of higher lows and it's just broken out of this consolidation to the upside. Looks a lot like what we're seeing in the Canadian dollar. Now, I, like many others, am not so bullish on our Canadian government. I'm hopeful that there will be an election. But again, Canadian dollar made a low in 2016, essentially an equal low in 2020, a higher low in 2022, which we've now held four times, and now we're turning higher. So stronger Canadian dollar, stronger Australian dollar, I think has real implications for the expectations of the global economic cycle. If commodity prices can turn higher with liquidity cycle and the commodity currencies are turning higher, I'm not sure I'd wanna bet against this. And speculators are net short, both Australian dollars and Canadian dollars, which means as it strengthens, not only do they have to cover but they can turn and go long. So I think that this is a really interesting dynamic at this point. Uh, and we've talked about this over the last little while. This is gold relative to the NASDAQ 100 underperforming through the 90s into 2001, 2001 through 2011, significantly outperformed. Well, we've underperformed since 2012. We made a first low in 2021. We got above trend line, came back and checked back to the trend line and now turning higher. I think this is an important relationship to watch. When I consider where people are invested, they are very focused in tech and they really don't like anything to do with commodity prices. My guess is that this can be a major adjustment. So of course we don't have to be everywhere. Our job is to identify market leadership but it's also our job to recognize change and position for it. Get there early and then let other people come in behind us. In the absence of leadership, we're happy to sit on cash. But what we sell here, as you guys know, at Barometer is a tactical approach. We pick our spots. Now, we want to find areas of the market that are seeing expanding breadth where over time more and more positions are performing well say in a sector or a market or an asset class, that's leadership. There's no bear markets happen when breadth is expanding. And we run models that track 300 different universes of securities trying to identify the places that money are being, money's being put to work. On the other hand, when breadth starts to deteriorate, it may be that the leading stocks continue to perform well. But if under the surface, fewer and fewer companies in its universe are performing well, it tells you that there is deterioration taking place and you need to be more cautious. So we use our top-down models to identify of the investable places we could go, which ones we want to focus on. Right now, from an asset class perspective, that includes equities and it includes commodities. And from a bottom-up perspective, we try to identify the vehicles or the securities we're going to use to express our view in those sectors and themes. And that, we address, that way we address each of the factors that drive return, getting the right asset class, finding the right sectors within those asset classes, and then identifying specific securities that, in our opinion, are good getting better, that are likely to be revalued versus their peers as investors come back to those groups. Okay, so just quickly, where do we stand? Last week, coming into the Fed, I put a note up on Twitter, and I said, very often when you come into an event, 
the market will come out behaving the way that it went in. Very often the setup going into an event is important to understand because it gives you clarity as to how vulnerable the market was. If we were seeing deterioration in all of our breadth models coming into the event, not only does it tell you the market's concerned, but it's vulnerable to sellers adding more weakness. As we sit today, almost all of our short and long-term indicators of breadth are healthy. That's what's given us confidence at this time of year, which often is not very much fun. Percent of stocks in uptrends in Canada, percent of stocks in the US stock market, percent of stocks in global markets in uptrends has been expanding. The percent of stocks trading above their 50 day moving averages have been improving. In the US, the percent of stocks with positive mo weekly momentum dipped a little over the last couple of weeks. That means things were consolidating, but the percent of stocks making new highs versus the percent making new lows is in the 90% range, meaning way more new highs than new lows. And then the percent of stocks trading above their 150 day moving average or 30 week moving average has been trending higher and is now at about 60%. So 60% of stocks in the US market, both by trend and by above the 150 day moving average are in long-term uptrends. That's healthy, it means the lots still aren't, but it means there's lots for us to choose from and that the conditions are favorable. So let's just talk about leadership for a moment. For many, many months, we've been talking about financials being uh, new leadership in the market. We started looking beyond the tightening cycle about eight months ago, and they've just been marching their way higher, and that continues. The insurance sector continues to move to new highs, and that includes property and casualty companies like RGA or Fairfax. It includes manual life. Uh, it includes uh, a number of companies within this group. The investment banks, this is the Capital Markets ETF, KCE. It's made up of companies like Goldman Sachs and Morgan Stanley. Uh, it's made up of asset managers. Relative strength has been improving since the middle part of 2022, and that just continues. This blue line is how the security is behaving relative to the S&P. We've said many times it would be highly unusual for the market to get into difficulty as the capital markets companies' shares were hitting new highs. So this continues to be a good indicator for us. The Canadian banks, boy, what a run they've had since they made their lows in July, trading above all moving averages. Of course, we've been focused in Royal and Commerce. TMX Group, shares of the TSX exchange. Well, this doesn't tell a very bearish picture. New 52-week high today. When we get to industrials, after a consolidation through the early part of the summer, today we closed at a new high. This is the equally weighted industrials ETF. It includes defense stocks. And we've talked about uh, Howmet Aerospace, which made a new 52 week high today, and BWX Technologies, which runs small nuclear reactors for the US Navy and is now selling them commercially. You may have seen this week Microsoft announced <clears throat> that they were reopening the Three Mile Island nuclear power plant to have a dedicated source of power for their cloud-based business. This probably puts a little bit of a fire underneath nuclear power. The materials sector. Now, this is one that should not do well if we think we're going to have a hard landing. And today we closed at a new all-time high for the sector. And that, of course, includes things like the gold stocks we're in. Agnico Eagle is the third biggest position in the firm. That's a multi-asset producer that generates a lot of cash. Uh, it's well diversified geographically uh, and uh, in friendly jurisdictions. Kinross is in our top 12 positions in the firm, trading better than 92% of stocks in the, in the S&P. And Alamos Gold is our emerging producer that we own. Uh, and uh, they're focused in uh, Mexico and Western Canada, trading better than 95% of companies in the S&P. Now, again, we are not gold bugs, but there's a time and a place. And when these things get going, they can go a long way. So we'll stay with the leaders as long as they continue to work. When we talk about uh, the base metals producers, tech resources is one I've talked about over the past year, I will admit it has been frustrating after its initial move higher. 
during the tightening cycle, really, it just traded in this very narrow band and came down to the long-term moving averages. It got up and out of its range over the course of this month. Uh, I think that the targets are much higher. When we look at the history here, uh, when they get into a cycle, you know, it can go up several hundred percent. Energy's probably been our most frustrating hold over the course of the year. This is a, a chart of the XEG, which is the Canadian producers universe. Now, if we compare the Canadian producers universe to the US producers universe, they look very different. The XOP ETF in the US, which is made up largely of shale oil producers, has been not performing very well. The XEG has traded in a very tight range. And while it hasn't been going up over the last few months, really not backed off very far and sort of got to the support levels a couple of times and has held. Specifically in the Canadian universe, we have focused on the big long life oil sands producers, which we think are going to be just massive cash flow generators over the next few years. They have all been committing to buy back shares. They've all been committing to dividend hikes uh, and they all are uh, not spending a ton of capital because they built out their capital uh, uh, investments over the last number of years. And so Imperial Oil would sort of be our poster child. It's been marching its way higher nicely. We think behaving very constructively. And if this is the beginning of a cycle, this is what the last cycle looked like. Again, these can go a long way up almost a thousand percent in the period between 1997 and 2008. So early days for commodities, some very constructive action in the currencies to support, uh, and certainly a loosening cycle or more liquidity is very supportive to these types of assets. They're early cycle assets, and the way they're behaving does not point to some kind of economic slowdown. Also in the energy space, we do have some service, a couple of service companies, Secure Energy Services made a new 52 week high today. And of course we've talked about Pemina Pipe <clears throat> and a couple of others of our uh, pipeline companies, which are paying very nice yields and moving smartly higher. So lots of the things that are working. Now, some defensive sectors that people have focused on over the last few weeks coming into the Fed's uh, cutting cycle, utilities continue to behave well. My guess is if the economically sensitive stocks really get going, these might slow down a little bit, but we've had a really nice uh, lift here in Southern Company and Nextera. The REITs, specifically the residential REITs, and our one big single position, Simon Property Group, made a new 52-week high, trading better than 84% of stocks in the S&P. This has been a good group for total return, capital appreciation, and dividend growth. Uh, this is the residential REITs ETF, which we own in our macro portfolio. Uh, it's had a really great pass as well. So the group that still has a question mark around it is tech. Uh, the XLK ETF is the large cap tech ETF. Uh, it pulled back 13.4% uh, over 18 days uh, in the month of July. It's been unable to get back to highs we now have two lower highs. We'll see. It doesn't mean that other groups get going. This group cannot perform, but I am conscious of the fact that it tends to be this group doesn't pair well with times when commodity stocks are doing well. If you think about it, over the last two years, while growth was scarce, people focused on these companies and they are fairly crowded. I'm not saying there aren't great companies. We've got still about... 12%, I believe, of our firm holdings in, in specific tech holdings. That's versus 30% in the S&P. So it's a very low weight. Uh, Broadcom has been one of our favorites. James has done a great job with this one. We're very close to 52-week highs. It's trading better than the group for sure. Uh, Meta in the communications group is behaving quite well. Uh, so there are some, some specific large cap securities doing well. But I just would say... It's a market here where there is there are other opportunities that are less crowded that maybe give us better risk reward. So what do the groups stack up like? When we put all of them on a distribution curve, 
that measures in each sector the percent of stocks in uptrends. The groups at this end of the spectrum have the smallest number of stocks or the lowest percent of stocks within their groups in uptrends, oil being the worst. We're not seeing expanding breadth and between only 16 and 20% of stocks within this sector are performing well. We go to the other end of the spectrum, banks, utilities, insurance, real estate investment trusts, Wall Street, builders, industrials or machinery, precious metals. You can see the biggest, the best breadth is down at the far right side. Now, when you go through a bull market over time, these groups tend to move to the right, meaning more and more stocks are participating. Generally, by late in a bull market, they'll all be stacked up here on the right side and everybody's making money and everybody's feeling great. That's a long way from where we are right now. The average sector has 46% of stocks and uptrends. So I said earlier, we made a new high in January. My guess is we have two to three years of relatively low volatility conditions. We are right in the heart of the most difficult time of the year. And I would say the market is extremely resilient. So how are we positioned? We got a lot of weight in financials. We think we're getting a great balance between strong balance sheets, good dividends, and good dividend growth. Tech is a much smaller than market weight, but we have some great holdings. And it's not to say we can't add positions back if the sector wakes up, but we got other stuff to do. Industrials, we have a significant overweight. Energy, we've taken our weight down a little bit. It's about 9%, but still significant overweight versus the S&P and underweight versus the TSX. Materials are close to a triple weight, a little bit more than a triple weight, the S&P. We think there's really good risk reward here. Consumer staples, we're about an equal weight. We talked last week about, oh, about Campbell Soup and, and, um, and uh, Philip Morris International, not my favorite company. Uh, healthcare, we have an underweight. We think that's a political hot potato, but our positions here in Lilly uh, are doing very, very well. Communications and consumer discretionary significant underweights. We still think that if there is anywhere we're going to feel a pinch, it's in the consumer and we're having a hard time finding ideas of companies performing well within the group. On the year, things are going pretty well. Equal weight s and is up 13, a TSX up 16, all worlds up 11.4, aggregate bond index, index up four, our income portfolio is up 19.6, our equity portfolio is up 17.4, both way outperforming their universes since the market started to broaden in March of 23. So now about 18 months ago, equal weights up 31, TSX up 29, uh, the all world index up 28, uh, aggregate up seven, our income portfolio is up 34% and the equity portfolio up 37. Uh, as we head to the end of the year, we wanna keep this in mind. We are into a liquidity cycle. I'll keep putting this up. Assets like liquidity. Stanley Druckenmiller has said over and over again, the single most important thing to asset prices is liquidity. When we look at credit spreads, credit spreads are tightening, meaning that bond investors do not believe there is credit risk. And we will look at volatility, that one little spike in volatility in July went away very quickly. And we are right smack in the middle of the range we have tended to be in during the best cyclical and secular bull markets of the last 30 years. So we'll watch, but we continue to be bullish equities. When we look out toward the fall, if things get more difficult and our models get more defensive, we're very happy to play defense and we've shown that in the past, but as it is, we just continue to incrementally move to the groups that are showing us the strength. Uh, we're doing a lot of fundamental work to make sure that we're comfortable with the earnings estimates uh, and with our expectations for earnings uh, and we'll follow our stop losses. If positions don't work, they come out of the portfolio. Um, 
I will say we got stopped out of some tech resources and some accounts earlier in the summer. Uh, we were buying back today, likely at higher prices. Uh, but we think that that's a group that can give us pretty good risk reward going forward. So with that, uh, if there's any questions, uh, let me take a look. Um, my friend Lawrence, who's often on the call, what are your best strategies to profit off of lowering the U.S. dollar? Well, you know, um, we're, we're putting our money where our mouth is. Uh, we have three significant positions in the gold and silver producers. Uh, we have... Uh, Tech B, uh, we have um, we have some Freeport, uh, we have um, uh, some Rio Tinto. So that's all of those are in the commodity space. Uh, and as we've talked about, we have positions in Japan and in India. Uh, we started specifically our global fund in December of last year to hold 40 high relative strength global equities outside of North America and 40 high quality value companies to give us index representation. Um, and so far the strategy is working very, very nicely. So global stocks uh, and commodities, and we think likely energy will follow along. Uh, those are the places we've really focused. Next question from Gerald, uh, do we think that the Iranian world is waking up? I do. Uh, I added some of the URA ETF yesterday um, uh, I could buy Cameco here. Um, I own some, uh, in my pro account, I own some NXE, which is a small, uh, uh, development company. Um, we do have some exposure there and we think that they should follow along. I think that the comments from Microsoft, uh, wanting to use nuclear power are, are really positive. We've seen around the world governments starting to reopen nuclear power plants. Really, it may be the most likely new source of baseload power in a world that is going to consume a lot more power. So I think we have to be looking at those groups. Any other questions? Huh. Okay. Well, so September 24th. Uh, happy birthday, Dad. And uh, we'll see you all next week uh, as we move into October. Have a great week.